Registers are not suitable for large-scale storage in ASEX and FPGAs. Instead, we have to declare memories in a way that allows the synthesizer to realize that we are talking about memories instead of registers. So there are two types of memories we uh, want to be able to declare in VHDM, ROMs and RAMs. And generally speaking, the syntax I'm going to describe allows synthesizers to realize we are talking about memories. What it does with memories then depends on uh, the target platform. So in FPGAs, uh, when it realizes we are talking about memories, it usually implements it as uh, block RAMs, uh, which are specialized uh, cells in the FPGA that uh, perform mass storage efficiently. In ASICs, on the other hand, uh, SRAMs, embedded memories, are usually implemented using a separate uh, memory compiler, and the synthesizer will often ignore the parts where we uh, declare memories and instead relegate them to the uh, memory compiler. Otherwise, the synthesizer might implement it as a large register file. In any way, uh, declaring memories in the way I'm going to describe allows you to write um, portable code that can be implemented on both FPGAs and ASICs. Uh, here we see the entity declaration and the architectural description of a ROM. So because we're talking about a ROM, you will find that it has uh, only uh, a, a data out port. It does not have a data in port. And that makes sense because we don't have writing. And so when we uh, consider this entity, it has a, uh, an address bus called address bus. In this case, uh, its width is address bits. And as usual, we are going to declare uh, the width of buses in terms of generics. This allows us to reuse the same design for uh, different uh, memories with different depth and different uh, bus width. And then we also have a data out port, which is uh, where we're going to read the data. We also have a clock, meaning that this is going to be a synchronous memory, and we have an enable signal. Now, uh, within the architecture uh, of, the, of the ROM, we declare a new type, and this is called ROM type, and it's an array. So this is a user-defined type. It is specifically an array of standard logic vectors whose length is uh, ROM word width minus one down to zero. ROM word width is a generic declared in the generics part of the component, and it is basically the uh, width of the output port, which then allows us to use it also as the width of the storage of the cells of the ROM. And so this is an array um, of words, each of which is ROM word width uh, wide. Then we also need to define the depth of this array, which is the length of memory, the number of storage locations in memory. And in this case, it is defined as two to the power of address bits minus one. So if you have 10 address bits, it's going to be 10, 24 storage locations and so on. If you are going to uh, declare the memory, uh, a memory whose uh, storage locations are not a power of two, then you would also need an, a third generic uh, in the generic parts where you declare the depth of the memory independent from the width of the address bus. If the depth of the memory is a power of two, then you only need to uh, define the address bus. Now, these two lines are only declaring the new type. We have not declared the signal of this type. So here we declare this internal signal, which is the contents of the ROM, and we call it ROM content contents, and it is of type ROM type. And this is initialized to the values shown here. And when a synthesizer sees this, it realizes that we want to implement the ROM because the contents of the memory are defined at synthesis time. And so uh, it will store these values in the memory and implement it as a ROM instead of as a RAM. We also define a, an internal signal called read data because uh, within the architecture, we will have two things happening. We'll have a clocked process and a concurrent assignment. Uh, on the clocked process, we uh, will look at each um, positive edge of the clock and see if there's an enable. If there's an enable, then data out will take the value of read data. But what is read data? Read data is the contents of uh, the current um, address 
uh, from the ROM contents. So we go to ROM contents and we seek address number address bus and assign it concurrently to the signal read data. This signal is going to be glitchy because it has combinational asynchronous assignment. And so you will find that it will change as soon as the address bus changes. To allow us to read a clean signal out of the memory in a synchronous way, we use this synchronization process, which assigns the value of read data, which is an internal signal, to the external synchronously read signal data out. Now, there's a couple of notes about, uh, about the uh, ROM here. First of all, how is it implemented? Um, usually in, uh, in ASICS, it's going to be implemented as a ROM, but in FPGAs, they usually don't contain uh, ROMs, so it, it's going to use a RAM anyway, and it's going to initialize it uh, to, to these values. Uh, now, this is an inefficient way to declare the contents of the ROM, just by uh, declaring them in the initialization here. If the size of the ROM is large, there's going to be a lot of text. In cases where the size of the ROM is large, we, de we, we describe the contents of the ROM usually uh, using file input outputs. So when we talk about file IOs, this will be one of the issues we will discuss, how to uh, initialize the uh, contents of a ROM from a file. Now, um, this is how we declare and use a ROM. One last thing, if we don't need the enable signal, if we want this memory to always be enabled, we can simply do that by connecting enable in the port map of the instantiation of the ROM to a one. We don't actually need to change the code. In that case, the, con the output of the memory will change uh, on every clock cycle, uh, as long as the address also changes uh, every clock cycle. Now, let's move to RAMs, uh, which is the more general case because uh, usually ROMs can be implemented using RAMs if we predefine the contents. And so, again, uh, the entity declaration of the RAM is going to contain at least two generics. One of them is going to describe, uh, let's call this X, it's going to describe the uh, number of bits in the address bit and the address bus of the, of the RAM. And uh, the other, let's call it Y, is going to define the number of bits in the data buses. On the other hand, uh, the difference between a RAM and a ROM is that the RAM will contain two address, bu two data buses, data in and data out. So it's going to have a D in bus, which is data in, and it's going to have a D out bus, which is data out. And the difference between them is that the data out bus is an output bus used to read data from memory, while data in is used to write data to memory. It's going to have a single address bus, on the other hand, uh, and its width is X, so there will be a single address bus, regardless of uh, the fact that we have two data buses. And when we talk about ports in a memory, ports are usually defined by how many address buses we have. This defines the number of address decoders we have, and it defines the number of simultaneous accesses to memory that we can do. There's also uh, the enable signal and the clock signal, which existed in the ROM, but there's an additional uh, control signal called write enable. And write enable is a single bit signal, and it's used to indicate whether in the current cycle we are writing or reading. This means that the uh, port, which is defined by the address, can only be used in a single cycle to either do reading or writing. So when write enable is zero, we are reading and we are reading the contents of the uh, address defined by the address bus and reading it on the out. When write enable is one, we are writing the contents of the data in bus Y and we are writing it to the address defined, defined by the address bus. This is the architecture of a uh, RAM block. And again, we define a new type. This new type is going to be an array of standard logic vectors. It's going to be exactly the same as the type we defined for uh, the ROM. And we're going to de define an internal signal for the uh, RAM in exactly the same way we did uh, for the ROM so that this would become the contents of the RAM. This would be, actual, be at the actual RAM memory. Then we have a single uh, process, and it's a clocked process. Uh, where we uh, do everything on the positive edge of the clock and we use the enable synchronously, again, we can actually um, 
we can um, uh, remove the effect of the enable if we hardwire it to a one when we instantiate the, the RAM. And then within the process, we have uh, two conditions. If write enable is equal to one, we are doing writing. If write enable is equal to zero, which we have to do uh, uh, otherwise, we are actually reading. So if we are writing, then the contents of the memory are going to be uh, data in. If we are reading, then the data out is going to be the contents of memory. And we are missing uh, a couple of braces here. But we are using the function conv integer, which simply uh, transforms a standard logic vector it's into its uh, integer uh, counterpart. So the address bus is going to change into its integer counterpart to allow us to refer to the index of the array type RAM memory. So what we are doing here is we are first writing to the memory. Uh, if we are writing in this cycle, otherwise we read to the memory. Note that we have, we don't actually use an else for this if statement because we are already in a clocked uh, process. We are already dealing with registers because that's what memories are, multiple registers. There's one question about uh, RAMs, which is what do we do with the data out bus? when we are writing. So let's imagine that write enable is equal to one and we are writing data on data in and we provide the address that we want. What appears on data out? Normally, in normal use, I would strongly recommend that you don't actually look at the uh, read data bus of the RAM in any cycle in which you are writing. You should ignore it completely. But there are multiple ways to deal with this. For example, this first way allows us to uh, write to the location, but we read first from this location. So this means that we are going to read the last value that was stored in that location before we did the current writing. And so this is what this implements. You might ask, um, how is this so? How are we reading the old value that was stored in memory if we have the writing happening first? But recall, that when we do this assignment within a process, this is only a transaction. And so what we're going to read here is still the old value. Transaction doesn't turn into an event until we reach the end of the process, because this is a process with a sensitivity list. In the second option here, we actually perform latching, which allows us to uh, read whatever was the last value on uh, the data output, regardless of what was written in this cycle. And so what we do here is that we allow data out to take the value of the contents of the memory if and only if write enable is equal to zero. But if write enable is equal to one, we leave data out undefined, which means that uh, the synthesizer will create a latch for data out to keep its old value in the cases where the write enable is equal to one. In the last uh, case, if write enable is equal to one, then we actually do define what data out is, and it is exactly data in. So it will just short data in to data out in cases where we are writing, and it will assign the contents of memory to data out in cases where we are reading. In most modern designs, we are more um, memory limited than we are core limited. This means that you usually have processing units doing uh, digital signal processing, and these units are really fast. What you do need actually is for these processing units to uh, read from and write to the memory much faster than the memory can afford to. So let's assume that the memory can be accessed at 100 megahertz, for example. You often find yourself having to access the memory like 200 megahertz or 300 megahertz at multiples of the speed at which you can access the memory. Um, this is a whole different topic, which has to do with time sharing uh, processing units and with how you divide data among memory banks. But one way uh, in which you can help alleviate this problem is to have memories with multiple ports. So multi-port memories are memories that will have uh, multiple read and write ports. And a read and a write port is not defined by the presence of a data bus. It's actually defined by the presence of an independent address bus. So if you have more than one address bus, let's say add one and add two and add um, n, this allows you to address, uh, to uh, 
refer to n independent locations at the same cycle. The cost, of course, is that each of these ports is going to have its own um, uh, address decoder, at least its own row decoder, which is um, not, not very cheap. It's actually kind of costly. But uh, let's talk about how uh, this can be declared in VHDL. And when we talk about memories, let's talk more about how the hardware for multi-port memories is handled. So this is the entity declaration for a two-port RAM, so it has only two ports, again, generics for bus width. And in this case, we will have two sets of uh, signals for each of the ports. So here we have uh, a different clock signal for each of the ports. This allows us to clock the two ports at different uh, clock rates. We have an independent enable and an independent write enable for each of the ports, which is usually necessary. And most important of all, we have independent data address buses for each of the ports. Without independent address buses, we cannot call this a two-port memory. We can actually um, have um, shared clocks or shared enables between the two ports. We cannot have a shared address bus. Otherwise, we go back to a single port case. We also have independent data in and data out ports. And this means that we have a two port RAM in which case uh, in, in which each of the ports can be used as a read port or a write port. They can be uh, uh, used asynchronously using different clocks and they have independent enables. Uh, of course, you can derive simpler cases from this case. So, for example, if you want the two ports to be synchronous, you can, when you instantiate, you can uh, short both of the clock signals to the same clock signal in the port map. Uh, you can make one of the ports read only, for example, by connecting its write enable to a zero, hardwiring its write enable to a zero during instantiation. So you can do a lot of things uh, at instantiation time to simplify the two port memory, but this is the most general way to declare it. Now, this is the architecture of the two port uh, RAM, and there's a small trick here that we have to take care of. So we declare a new type as we did with the RAM, as we did with the ROM, and this type is an array, and the array contains standard logic uh, vectors. And we have two processes, one process for the first uh, port and the other process for the second port. If you look at each of the processes, it's exactly the same as the process for a single port memory. Uh, here, each of them is acting on an independent clock, which is the more general case. So there's Nothing weird, uh, nothing very different from the single port memory happening here, except for this line. So in this line, we declare something new that we haven't seen before, and it's called a shared variable. This is the only case we will, where we will see a variable declared in the architecture declaration part, not in the process declaration part. So what is a shared variable? A shared variable is a variable that exists between multiple processes. When one process calls it, it can modify its contents. When the other process calls it, the variable will keep the values that it got from the first process. So it's a variable that can be manipulated by different processes and that will keep its values between calls uh, by the multiple processes. So a normal variable is declared within a process declaration part, and it only exists for that process, and it only survives in that process. A shared variable is different. And the reason we have to use a shared variable here is, if you look at the shared variable, it's actually the memory itself. It's the RAM memory, and it's of RAM type. And What's happening here is that, the, is, the, is that the first process, this process, is manipulating uh, this memory by writing to it, and the second process is also manipulating it by writing to it. And if you use a signal to declare the contents of memory here, you will get an error, either from the compiler or at least from the synthesizer, because a process, uh, a signal cannot be written to by two processes. This will create a contention on the node and is not allowed. The only way you can code a uh, couple of processes uh, manipulating the same node is to use a shared variable.